Welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the fourth Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for Dr. Lori Marvis. And today she is going to talk about the 10 things she wish she wishes every patient would know before going plant-based. Please welcome her to the show. Hi, AJ. Thank you for having me. Hi, I love your background. It's, I know it's real, but it looks virtual. Yeah, you know, thank you. Yeah, it's um yeah, it's real. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you. I need to put some more plants. I killed the last one, so I'll try another <laughs> try some more. So um, this is a great topic. Yeah. Plant based you know, 101. Yeah, I, I think so. And it's uh I created this workshop I'm hosting tomorrow, which I'll share about later, but the um it's like a recurring theme, right? These these are like the visitors that just keep coming and you think you answer them once, but they revisit time and time again. And so I thought it'd be nice to just kind of share with people as they're contemplating going plant-based or maybe they're new to the plant-based uh, lifestyle kind of things to be looking out for. And um, I think it'll save a lot of frustration, um, at least, you know, generally we'll talk in kind of a bigger sense, but I do have a share screen here let me nice to play from start Oop, but let me share first i think i share Almost sounds like it should be a flyer you hand out to the patients <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know when i first went plant-based i created a 30 page handout i i'm sure i killed some trees and i apologize that i wasn't aware but i literally because i was taking all the notes of patients and i was trying to give answers in the very you know first year or two that i went plant-based and was sharing it with patients um and that was a very helpful document. Um, but this is kind of a play on that a little bit. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I'll play from start here. So, all nice. right. Um, let me get started here. So the 10 things I wish my patients knew <laughs> about before going plant-based. Um, and this is what it is. So thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, first of all, you know, really it's the importance of whole foods. And I think this gets down to a few really important um nuances to a plant-based diet. So, so many times people think, oh, well, if I go plant-based, they go immediately to the produce section, right? When I first would help people transition to a plant-based diet, I didn't really emphasize the need to include starchy vegetables and legumes and whole grains. They just went to, you know, fruits and veggies, which makes sense now, you know, in retrospect. But in addition to that, and especially nowadays, we have all these processed vegan plant-based uh, foods, which are not necessarily healthy for you. Now, they might be helpful in the sense of transitioning. It might be better for the animals and planet, and I'm not negating that. But for your overall health, we really want to do a few things. Maximize nutrients, right? So you want to choose whole form over processed as much as possible. And what I mean by process is more of the ultra process. So you could even take oatmeal for a great example. You have oat groats, which is the least processed oat. Then you have steel cut oats where they've chopped it up just a little bit. Then you have the rolled oats, which is a little bit further processed. And then you have like literally the instant oats. So what's interesting about this is when you consume these foods, they react a little bit differently. And I work a lot with patients who have diabetes or insulin resistance, um, elevated blood sugars, prediabetes, type two diabetes, you name it. You'll see really interesting effects of blood sugar. And I've seen it in myself when I wore a CGM. The, for example, if you did just for myself, rolled oats compared to steel cut oats, there's about a 30 point difference in my blood sugar spike. So which is really fascinating. So there's some important things that are occurring here as far as absorption, uh, blood sugar is just one thing, but we really want to maximize the nutrients because many times when the foods are processed, nutrients are lost. Now it doesn't mean you avoid things like legumes and lentils because these have to be cooked. Um, so that's part of the process, but that's how we make them edible. So I do want to kind of emphasize the least processed to the point that they're edible, the best. Um, next would be like kind of avoiding that processed vegan foods. And I recall early in my journey as a plant-based physician that I also didn't say, hey, stay away from the things in the freezer. I obviously do that well now, but in the beginning, we just had a few things, but um, boy, they really hung on to these because they were still hitting those things that make people crave ultra processed foods to begin with. They're high in sugar, salt, and fat. So again, we want to move back to the whole food as much as possible. 
And then really just understanding these are such health benefits, right? We lower disease risk of, you know, heart disease, cholesterol, hypertension, type two diabetes, obesity, all these things that come with it. And I think people are naturally moving towards and understanding that, but you're going to only get these health benefits when you choose the whole food over the processed foods, right? When you're really thinking about the type and quality of the diet. And um, interestingly enough, for example, a very simple thing is that you can see in studies how the diet quality, even in a plant-based diet, so an ultra-processed plant diet, vegan diet, compared to a whole food plant-based diet can really help the improvement of the quality of your sleep, for example. Um, and it'll also help with your weight loss, right? And it'll also help with some of these, um, the food addiction component of that. But I think I, I got my point across there. So let's really focus on whole foods, guys, and the variety of whole foods, lots of colors. <laughs> um, next is something else that I've come across, um, you know, as I'm licensed in all 50 states, and I've seen thousands of plant-based patients at this point, um, there's really some interesting things. When people get very, very restrictive, when, for example, they're removing, you know, maybe one or two uh, plant foods because of things they've heard or something they're worried about, what happens is one, they may lose out on, for example, um, nutritional deficiencies, right? They may be uh, losing out on, you know, enough calories to sustain and fill well, the satiety factor. Um, so those are just a few of those things. So we really want to be mindful that, you know, eating from all the different food groups in accordance with, you know, a healthy uh, calories to maintain a healthy weight, that's what you really want to look for. Um, and, you know, we don't have to hit a certain percentage. We don't have to hit a certain this. Just be mindful that you want to eat, again, fruits, veggies, beans, whole grains, nuts and seeds. And then when you're doing it in a mindful way, that's really, really important. Now, the eating disorder piece, this kind of reaches into that restricting, right? So we're always thinking of dieting in the sense of like, we have to restrict. That's the only way we're going to get um, to see benefit. But if you're doing too much restrictive eating or excuse me, too much restriction, you can almost become overdone in a zealous way, even in a healthy diet pattern. There's actually um, an actual diagnosis for this in medicine. And so the important thing here to remember is that when you're eating, it's to fuel your body. Um, some people just really, they just cling to it as almost like a religion that they have to do this. And if anybody says differently, they're wrong. And so anyway, it can just lead to some really in, um, interesting disorders with eating. Um, we want a healthy relationship with the food, that it's there to nourish us. And I mentioned before, balance is key. But the restriction piece can be quite concerning. I've had patients whose BMI was, you know, 15 because they were so worried about eating things because they heard somewhere that, you know, eating even healthy whole fats was wrong and it would make them sick. And they were literally to the point where they were malnourished. So it's just really important that we pay attention to that. And I will tell you, I've seen it more, more often than not. And uh, it's not a rare case. Uh, if it was rare, I probably wouldn't bring it up, but very important. Okay. And a few other things. So we, of course, the, I think, again, when we think about the balance and we do diversity, we're going to have less of these issues, but I do want to highlight a few things that I've seen occur in a few individuals. Um, number one is B12. And I have seen patients who didn't quite understand the need for supplementation. Um, some individuals may feel like they can get it from fortified foods. I personally don't want to risk that because you can have permanent nerve damage and some other things with um, elevated, or excuse me, a, a B12 deficiency. So supplementation um, is appropriate and you should base it on your labs. Um, another one that can be controversial is omega-3s. Uh, if you're eating enough nuts and seeds in the ALA form, like so you get walnuts, chia, uh, ground flax, you may be very well enough to get enough to help with your, your uh, brain health and stuff. But when you start looking at pregnancy, uh, children, some other things, some omega-3 supplementation might be appropriate. And then there's some testing and some other things and discussions um, on what that does. And I've certainly seen individuals, for example, who may be dealing with some very inflammatory disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, different things. We provide uh, algae omega supplementation in a small amount, um, and they see some improvement in their overall 
well-being. So just some thoughts there. Now, iron is another interesting one. Um, there's the heme and non-heme iron. So heme typically from animal products a non-heme uh, from the plants is a little bit harder to absorb, but you know, you can actually um, kind of pair these things with high vitamin C, which comes in so many plant foods. It does help the heme iron, non-heme become a, a little bit more absorbable. Where it becomes an issue is when individuals, for example, may be taking uh, medications or maybe they have a digestive disorder where they're not absorbing the iron very well, or maybe they're losing iron uh, for someone who's having heavy menses. And it's hard to maybe necessarily, um, and if you're not paying attention to that, get enough from your food. So again, first of all, figure out why. Maybe it's just they need to improve their iron-rich food consumption, and many times that'll take care of it. But if there's something else going on, we do need to pay attention. Um, so again, measurement. And what I like to do is measure your iron, uh, which is available in the blood, right? That's your iron that's hanging out. That's, it'll just say iron on your labs. And then you'll have total iron binding capacity, which tells me basically if you had a hotel, if there was a, how many rooms are empty. So the more rooms are filled up, that means your iron binding capacity will decrease. If it's high, that means that you have less iron. And so there's more vacancy. The, and then the last thing that's very important that I love to check, it's very, very simple. It's called ferritin. Ferritin is a protein that hangs on to iron and helps it store. Um, you typically want to see that above 50. And um, many times I'll see women who are complaining of fatigue, um, hair loss, uh, and potentially restless leg syndrome. Um, and we check their ferritin and it's really low. But again, these are typically because they're high and you're having heavy menses or something else like that. Um, we do the appropriate action to help them and they have significant improvement and again, in their symptoms. Calcium, you don't need supplementation, but we do want to pay attention and, and explain to people, you can get plenty of calcium on a plant-based diet, especially if you're including those, you know, legumes, you're including things like almonds, you're doing, uh, the most, the most beneficial one I like is soy products, especially the whole soybean, the edamame, the tofu, the tempeh. These are great sources of calcium. And then of course, vitamin D, I would measure, right? Because really depends on the person. If you have darker skin or if you wear sunscreen often, if you're not outside very much, you may not be getting enough sunshine to do that natural conversion. Myself, um, when I lived in Florida, I was running, oh heavens, 30 to, I don't know, 90 minutes a, on a daily basis. My vitamin D was still below 30. So I take a small amount of supplementation by me because it's so important for your immune system, your bone health, and many, many other things. So there's that. Again, we go back to plan for diversity, increase different absorption. Supplementation is my non-negotiable for everyone on the B12. And most of my patients need 500 to 1,000 micrograms a day. Um, that's not everybody. If we put them on that and we measure it and it's elevated, we decrease or pull back on the number of days per week. Um, but that's just what I've seen. And I've seen a lot of labs. Again, I just want to highlight the importance of vitamin B12 because it's so important for your brain and health. And if you're raising plant-based little people, please make sure they're getting the appropriate B12 as well. Now, sometimes I get questions, should I do the cyanocobalamin or the methylcobalamin? <clears throat> I prefer that you do the cyanocobalamin. And the reason is it breaks down into hydroxycobalamin, which then goes down the two pathways where it's converted into methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin. These are very important because you have the nerve component and then you have the blood cell component. So you may have heard, oh, someone has B12 deficiency, they might have B12 deficiency anemia, right? That's one pathway. Or if someone's getting tingling um, and some weakness or brain fog, that's the other pathway. So the methylcobalamin just goes down one pathway. So if you want to do the methylcobalamin and avoid the cyanocobalamin, I would do a methyl and a denosylcobalamin. Um, so that's an important thing. Again, you want to test regular blood tests. Those tests are going to be homocysteine. You want it to be less than 10. And methylonic acid, you want to see it in, uh, in the normal range or low. Um, again, these are two things that are need B12 to be further metabolized so that when they're elevated, that tells me that B12 is probably inefficient. And when you measure your B12, you want to be above 500 and less than around 1100 or so. And that range is great because the reason I say 500, even though that's above the low normal, which is typically around 250 or 300 on most labs, 
I have seen people symptomatic and show abnormal homocysteine and some other things below 500. So again, that's just some general uh, information I wanted to provide about B12 in general. <clears throat> okay, and I think everyone understands, especially with Dr. B's book, The Power of Fiber, but just throwing this out there, gut health and beyond, really it's important for digestion. It's amazing for blood sugar control, um, great for satiety, um, again, decreasing risk for things like colon cancer, things like that. You want a variety of these foods so you can get the different types of fiber, right? And I don't need to go deep into the different types of fiber, but really important that you, again, fruits, veggies, whole grains, like gooms, very, very important. There might be a little bit of <laughs> change in your digestion. You might notice that you might be a little bit bloated. You might notice that you're like suddenly going to the bathroom more often. You might be a little bit more gassy. There are also some things you can do to aid in that. Number one, maybe if you hadn't been eating beans so much, maybe pull back and go to lentils. Um, lentils <clears throat> are a great way to introduce. Maybe you start with a tablespoon a day and then you just build up maybe every week or two and monitor how you're feeling. Over time, anywhere between three to six months is when I've seen people where they're able to consume, you know, half a cup to a cup and a half of beans daily and do okay. Um, if you've had a course of antibiotics, uh, you may find yourself when you go back to your normal diet or if you're eating a normal diet, you may have some of these symptoms as well. Because remember, antibiotics not only kill the, you know, the offending agent that was making you ill, but also can cut out cut um, the lifespan of the gut health or your gut microbiome. And so you really want to think about just taking some time. Then of course you have your prebiotics and then your probiotics. Some individuals might benefit from a supplemental probiotic for a short period of time, or they could do something like uh, unsweetened, uh, you know, plant-based yogurt. Uh, there's other fermented foods, lots of ways to approach this. But again, just highlighting the importance of fiber because so many people who are just starting this plant-based diet aren't fully aware that we're walking around fiber deficient individuals in the United States and I'm sure beyond. Okay, this is another myth I've heard often is that I can't do this, I'm on a budget. I'm like, oh. so that's because we're focused in on the processed foods, right? We're focused in on these plant foods that are not going to be um, ones that we just can find in, in nature, right? So when we take out the process component of it, they get cheaper. So what you want to do is buy in bulk, seasonal, and local. And what I found when I first went plant-based in Colorado, even through the dead of winter, <laughs> um, my, my budget with uh, my husband, I had two teenage boys and a teenage daughter at that time at home, dropped $400 per month. And that was in 2012. So now with food being so expensive, you I'm telling you, dried beans, whole grains, those are some of the cheapest things you can buy. Bananas, apples, you know, um, there's amazing produce available. Long-term savings, I think this is a no-brainer, but as you get healthier, your healthcare costs decline. As a population as a whole, if we think about this, as a population as a whole improves or overall healthcare costs actually decrease, which you then you'll probably see a decrease in your premiums of your own insurance, right? So you're not having to carry the burden of those who are ill because there's more healthy people. Um, and the last thing about this that might be very helpful is meal prepping, right? So when you prep and prepare, you will save. And the reason I say that is because you'll be less inclined to go like, oh man, I'm so tired. Let's just go out to eat, right? So we're not only eating healthier when we're at home, but we're also saving money because cooking at home is so important. We literally have turned our kitchens over to big corporate America. We need to take that back and spend most of our time uh, with our food in our own kitchens. It's healthier. You know what's going into it and you will save money. Okay. Um, again, I'm just going to highlight again a few different things here. Why meal prep, meal planning and preparation is important. Um, I think one of the other main reasons I hear people is our first time is like, man, this takes a lot of time. And that alone, sometimes they'll use an excuse not to continue. Unfortunately, I really want to encourage people to understand your health needs to be your priority. So you need to find the time. We all have the time. If you spend any time watching television or scrolling through, you know, your phone and stuff, we have time to take a little effort to prepare healthy meals. And when you're planning, you can think about how can I do this in batches? Maybe you batch on Sunday and Wednesdays. 
you make a grain, you make a uh, beans or something, maybe you roast some veggies. Like I have some Japanese uh, purple sweet potatoes in the fridge that I made uh, on Sunday. So I ate two yesterday, I'll eat two probably today. Um, again, you could do those type of things. You can take a uh, chia seed and mix it with some non unsweetened uh, plant-based milk uh, and put that in the fridge. So you'll have it in the morning. You could do overnight oats. Uh, there's so many different ways you could do. You could create some nice sauces or use some of these California balsamics that Chef AJ turned me on two years ago. They're fantastic. Lots of ways to think about how you can make foods easy and quickly. Just takes a little a bit of effort a few times a week and you'll save time, money, taste better. You know what's in it and your health will benefit. Keep it simple, guys. Keep it simple. It doesn't have to be fancy. And don't be afraid to go in the kitchen. It's just a kitchen. You're not you're not on TV trying to be an iron chef. You just just go out there and try to play it around with it. If it doesn't work, great. You learned something. You learned what didn't work. So you'll be better next time. Okay. The next one, that's a really big one, right? I think um, so many people struggle with this. And I spent quite a bit of time talking to my, uh, I run a glucose mastermind group. And last night <clears throat> we were talking and they loved our conversations because, you know, here's a, a group of 10 to 12 people and we're sitting and discussing as they connect, right? The, many of them were saying how, man, nobody else in my social circle eats this way. And one had traveled somewhere and people were making comments about her plant-based diet. And even though she had lost weight and her blood sugars are improved, but she was so compelled to stay this way because she felt so good. She had brought her own food. She continued to eat it. And, but she calls me and it was really sad, you know, cause I'm, I feel like I'm walking these two paths. Like you got one foot in this trying to be healthy and eat, but then you want to maintain, you know, social uh, relationships and such. And I think it's really important to understand. There's a few ways you can do this. You can prepare number one by when you go out to eat, you can check menus, you can call ahead, request something. If you're going to a potluck, you can bring dishes. That's a simple thing if you can, if you have somewhat control. The other pieces are the comments that people make. And I think it, when there was one uh, story I could share real quick, um, I had gone out to eat with some individuals that I didn't know very well. We were acquaintances and we sat down and I did my normal thing where I'm asking the waiter, Hey, can you make this, this, and that to make it more plant-based, whole food plant-based and, you know, something that I'd feel good about putting in my body. And when it came, you know, the person sitting next to me, they go like, well, what is that that you're eating? And I explained, you know, this is this, and I'm a plant, you know, I eat plant-based diet. And it was really interesting. They looked at the my plate and then they looked at theirs and they're like, so are you saying that mine isn't healthy? <laughs> so that kind of, you know, I kind of giggle now. Uh, but then it was like, wow, that was a really interesting thing to say to me. Number one, I'm a physician and I eat a plant-based diet. So I could take this two ways. I could pull out the doctor card, which I didn't, boy, it was tempting, but I didn't because <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, instead, what I say, well, yeah, I, I've eaten a plant-based diet for several so long. And this is why would you like to learn more? And, um, you know, I just completely avoided feeding into that drama or that that position that they want because that's what those people want they want you to feed into their drama to feed into their ego that they're right and you're wrong instead you disarm them you can disarm them with humor i did a youtube live yesterday or two days ago all about um the humor piece i i ate mr sumo but i had a little sumo and i drew a little face on it and i was pretending that he was holding up signs it was mr sumo with the sign and he was like this one it said isn't it hard to get enough protein? I mean, these are just common things you're going to get. And so I gave some quips back on <laughs> what to say. Anyway, um, check it out if you want to laugh at me. It's all appropriately good. <laughs> and so anyway, you can use humor. And the other thing you could say is, you know, my doctor said I should be eating this way. So I'm just following doctor's orders. That's an easy way out. You can tell them I'm your doctor, even if I'm not. That's okay, too. It's all good. Um, but anyway. The other pieces is find your tribe. Spending time with someone like, you know, Chef AJ's amazing community here. I have an amazing community on Facebook. We have YouTube. You have a look locally, right? We want to connect with people in person. So maybe you can do like a plant pure community or you can start your own. Um, and I think once you start putting out the vibe that you're looking, people come out of the woodwork. You're like, wow, I didn't even know someone lived down the street that also eats this way. 
So, you know, I really want to encourage people, don't be dissuaded to continue eating this way because at the end of the day, what words are coming out of someone's mouth should have no bearing on what's going in your mouth, in your body. Now, the only bodies you should be concerned about are the ones that live under your roof if they're adults that you're responsible for. Like, you know, maybe you make food for your spouse. I would still encourage you to cook plant-based. But if you have kids, again, inside your home, under your roof, you need to be cooking the foods that you know are going to fuel your body and your health and those people that you are responsible for. So, all right, I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, the transition process. So there's a few ways to do this. If anyone has heard my story, I just kind of went overnight very quickly and it was amazing and wonderful for me. That's my personality. Others require a gradual change. Um, and I think, and again, different personalities, different abilities, and there's no wrong way to do this and there's no right way to do this. So I think what you need to look at is what it works best for you. Gradual small steps do work very nicely for many, many things. So maybe you start with breakfast, right? You do breakfast first for a week, then you go to breakfast and lunch for a week, and then you go breakfast, lunch, and dinner for after that. So lots of different things you can do appropriately, or maybe it's just adding, you know, like, man, all I can do is just add one plant-based food to my daily intake. That's a great start, but don't get stuck in the starting, right? So you really want to continue to make progress. It can be gradual progress, but you still want to produce progress. Um, and then you really were interesting. So some people will change their diet <clears throat> and need, um, they like feel amazing. I have had others that will go from maybe a week to two weeks to maybe, you know, yeah, about a week to maybe up to two weeks where they don't feel well, right? They're, I don't know, we call it detox syndromes. We like the, their body is just like, oh my goodness, what's going on? The other thing you want to pay attention to is if you're on medications for diabetes or hypertension, you want to be able to look at those and make sure that those are being peeled back as soon as possible because you don't want to take too much medications that can lower blood sugar and put your life in danger or cause you to have too low blood pressure and pass out or hurt yourself that way. So again, pay attention to what's going on and then seek support, right? You're not alone. Either it's, you know, you find a plant-based physician, a plant-based group, a plant-based dietitian, you know, reading, uh, check out some amazing website like Dr. Gregor's, you know, the nutritionfacts.org. So many ways to find support these days. So please understand you're not alone in your journey. There's an amazing support system out there and it's growing every day and you can become a part of that so that when you are walking your journey, guess what? People are watching and they're going to come to you for support and you're going to be able to provide it because you've done this journey yourself. So there is that. Um, okay, next, long-term sustainability. Some people are like, man, I'm only going to do this for 30 days. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, maybe we have to have that mindset to get started. But I really would love to people say, instead of a plant-based diet, like, say, let's talk about a plant-based lifestyle, right? So how do we do that? How do we go from this way I was eating to making this, I could do it for a short period of time, but I really want to do it long-term. I think there's a couple of things. One, understanding all the benefits and everything that you're doing, make it fun and enjoyable, right? So think about the different things you can do with the foods that you love. Trying different recipes, really important. Really focusing in and being grateful for the health benefits and what you're seeing changing, right? And when you run into obstacles and you run into circumstances that aren't ideal, instead of thinking of them as problems or thinking of them as like, oh, here we go again, look at it as a different way. Look at this, turn towards it, don't resist it, don't complain about it, don't fight it. Instead, turn towards it and go, hmm, this is an interesting life circumstance, whatever that might be. I'm gonna look at this as an opportunity to learn right? So a recipe didn't go well. What can I learn from this? Oh, I don't put in this much of that ingredient oh, or maybe I shouldn't cook it for that long. Um, uh, someone, you know, your spouse is giving you a hard time about doing this. So like, what can I learn about this? Um, instead of saying, man, he just fights me. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe you should turn and say, interesting, observe him for the person that he is, honor and respect him. But at the same time, go, what is he doing? trying to get me to change my diet, right? What does that say? What is the story that is telling himself that he's identified with 
to want to say these things to me or try to sabotage me and come through it with a, a form of compassion instead of like, I don't get it. I'm going to fight the way because that's just going to fuel it, right? So the more you fight it, the more you restrict it, like I can't do it, the harder it gets. But if you turn towards it, have compassion, accept it for what it is and understand you have a choice of how you deal with it, it gets so much easier. Um, and actually it becomes comical at sometimes when you hear some of the things people say, instead of getting angry, you just like, that is that so? That's really funny. Or you just say, is that so? And move on. So anyway, that's what I found that works best in a lot of life circumstances. Um, but yeah, you guys just, you know, if again, if you have a problem, just figure out how I can learn from it and make it a way to find a solution. Who knows? Someone might come to you with the same problem and you'll have some ideas to help how to counsel them. So with that being said, <clears throat> I do have a plant-based one-on-one workshop. It's tomorrow um, at 4 p.m. Pacific time. You can check out Dr. Marbus. Link, I think, is down below in the YouTube uh, uh, copy. And uh, yeah, it's uh, almost a 100-page ebook. And um, I put my heart and soul in all the years I've been plant-based doctor into that. This, And so it's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, it covers everything you could possibly know. Thank you. This was great. I have a couple of questions though. The first thing I want yeah. to know, because I'm nosy, is the person that said, so my meal isn't healthy. What was it exactly? <laughs> it was a person that I used to work with in Rifle. So yeah. But I mean, was it like, like, was it macaroni and cheese? Was it pizza? Oh, was what it were either? they eating? Yeah, they what were, were eating, they eating? It was like a lasagna, if I remember right. Some Italian dish. Yeah. yeah. It was like, yes. well, there's cheese and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Was it a medical professional or not a non-medical? Was a medical professional, yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, that's funny. I would have probably said, "Well, of course you don't know. You didn't learn anything <laughs> in medical school." I'm just kidding. But you know, it's interesting what you said about roll notes uh, because I, I, you know, I don't. I, that seems to be the go-to breakfast for everybody on a plant-based diet. Not that it's yeah. unhealthy, but I much prefer the the oat groat more than yeah. the rolled or the steel cut or the instant oat, not just because I feel it's nutritionally superior. I actually think it's tastes better. Mm -hmm. And with a pressure cooker, it only takes five minutes, but I feel that rolled oats are so processed because they've been flattened, steamed and flattened again. I, the reason I say this is not from the nutritional standpoint, but I used to be a pastry chef at a restaurant. And one of the recipes that I make, it, it, it's still, I still make it. I made it last night for a friend's birthday, my outrageous brownies. It called for a one and a half cups of oat flour. And on that, and so the restaurant, we just would make our own. Instead of buying oat flour, we take our rolled oats and grind them in the Vitamix. Well, on that particular night, the Vitamix was broken and I had to finish my orders. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I put the rolled oats in whole and they pretty much just cooked. They dissipated. Like, you know what I mean? It's like they wow. dissipated. And then I started thinking, wow, this really is more flour like than whole grain like, because like if you take an oat groat between your fingers and rub it, it's still going to stay an oat groat. But if you take a rolled oat between your fingers and rub it, it will turn into a flour. And that's why even it, you know, I know, you know, the, the, the nice folks at Mastering Diabetes, they talk about that in their book, that it's in the hierarchy of grains that they don't really even recommend it for their diabetics, you know? Right. right absolutely. Um, but it's such a, it's a food that so many people are familiar with. And so it's an easy go-to when they're starting a plant-based diet. And then they'll complain about the time component. That's why I like, you know, well, batch cook, you can do batch cooking, steel cut oats. I used to do steel cut oats with quinoa half and half. That was a phenomenal, yummy. My family's like, what are you doing? But I was like, man, I love this stuff. But, um, you know, I'd make big batches and just warm it up in the morning um, with a little added uh, unsweetened milk. And that was delicious. Yeah, batch cooking is great. And like I say, with a pressure cooker, it really doesn't take very much longer sure. to cook the oat groats than it do does to, you know, microwave your rolled oats, you know? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And they really do taste better. Well, thank you. So a um, couple of questions have been sent in in advance. Yes. The first one is from Amanda. And she said, I've accumulated a significant amount of biomarker data over the years and haven't found a doctor to help me sort through everything and make sense of the symptoms I've been experiencing. Do you have a recommendation for a medical specialty that could help me specifically to help read through blood work data? Well, you can do that, I think. Yep. Yeah, I, I can absolutely do that. So I'm licensed in all 50 states in DC. So yeah, I even see international patients. So so she doesn't necessarily need a specialist. She just needs no. somebody that, yeah. that understands that if I understand yeah question correctly. So there you go, Amanda, book a session. The information will be right below in the show notes. 
Gosh, I saw another question for you because I even sent it to you. So maybe I'll look at it that way. It was about mm -hmm. soy. That comes yeah. up a lot. You know, is soy good? Is is yeah. soy bad? And I don't think the person is saying, is it bad? Um, she's asking, is, is, this, is this quantity okay to eat? And her name is Karen. And she said, is it okay to eat tofu every day? I eat approximately eight to 10 ounces a day. I also love edamame and I eat them every day. I'm 55, an extremely healthy vegan. I just hope I'm not eating too much tofu or soy. Yeah. So I think, you know, two to three servings, which would be half a cup of the whole beans, whatever that equivalent is based on whatever else you're eating, the tofu or tempeh or the edamame is fine. And there's actually some amazing benefits that you do that. I typically recommend soy products with my people who are dealing with high cholesterol. It's a great source of protein. It helps with cholesterol. It's a great source of phytoestrogens, which compete with our natural estrogen, which decreases our risk for breast cancer, improves um, survivability, decreases risk of recurrence. It's great for your bone health. It's great for fatty liver. So soy in and of itself is a wonderful, wonderful food. Um, and yeah, so I think that's fine. If you're a healthy person and you're not having any allergies to soy, I was like, yeah, I have no problem with that at all. Great. You know what? Let me see if there's any questions. I, you know, I don't think I even opened the chat today. I'm a terrible person, but I can pick it up <laughs> on you. We stream so many places that yeah. I, sometimes I have to jump back and forth with screens and I always worry about that. So, you know, now that we're also streaming on Instagram, there could be possibly a question there and Twitter and Facebook. It's just hard to be everywhere all at once, guys. So the one time I'd, okay, let's just, let me look at the YouTube chat and see if there's any questions there. Da, 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 da. Well, please put four question marks first so I can differentiate a question from the comment. And while I'm looking for questions, maybe you can talk about the program that you do and people want to join that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the main program that I'm doing besides seeing patients is the Healing Kitchen with Brittany Giroudi, which I'm sure has been a guest on your show many times before. Um, she has her own wonderful weight loss story with 70 pounds. She's only 4'11", so <laughs> that's quite a significant weight loss, uh, reverse hypertension, high cholesterol. And now she's pregnant with her baby due May 27th, which is amazing, her first baby. And so we run a healing kitchen. We work together. We do live sessions every week. Uh, she cooks. I answer medical questions. And then we do two expert workshops. Uh, my workshop that I do and is free to our healing kitchen members and uh, experts. We've had Dr. Joel Kahn. We've had uh, Brenda Davis. We've had Kim Campbell. Um, we've had some amazing guests. And I think Aaron Stancic is our guest this month. And so, or March, it would be March. Uh, tomorrow, um, I'm also doing that workshop. Um, we can, if you don't want to join the Healing Kitchen, you can join outside of, you know, workshop alone. Um, and it's plant-based 101. The other workshops I've done and you have access to are osteoporosis, plant-based labs. Hmm, what was it? <laughs> I've done so many now. Uh, weight loss, insulin resistance. I think next month I'm going to work on hypertension, high cholesterol. I'll be doing one on menopause. Um, yeah, so those workshops comes with an ebook, and then I do a uh, I have a psychology of weight loss course uh, in group and the glucose mastermind where people get a CGM, um, and I'm thinking of doing one where I can order labs for them as well, and we walk them through an amazing program. Uh, yeah, we've had patients lose 20, 30 pounds, blood sugars improve within weeks, you know, dropping 150, 200 points on average, um, just by being aware of what's going on. So. Thank you. I'm seeing the questions now. So thank okay. you for your patience. Charlene says, is there a way to make tempeh taste better? <laughs> Excuse me, my throat was dry. Um, can you make tempeh taste better? I think, it, you know, think about any like tempeh or tofu. You need to think of this as a conduit of flavors. So I would probably make up some type of marinade um, and you could actually soak that overnight. But Chef AJ, I'm sure you have made tempeh in the past I or mean, other dishes. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I mean, I, first of all, I think it already tastes good. You know what I mean? So you yeah. can buy it now and it comes in a multiple of kinds and flavors. So yeah. I'm curious, which kind is she buying and how is she preparing it? First of mm, all? Yeah. So I think somebody's just buy the plane and then they don't know what to do with this chunk because that's just, they've never done it. So I cut it up I like to put it in stir fries, uh, which I use, you know, broth or water, but with lots of veggies, there's probably like a kind of a um, miso type flavoring that I would do with that. And that just picks up those flavors and it's delicious. Um, that's how I typically use it. 
Nice. Well, this question, I don't know if you can honestly answer without bias, but mm. <laughs> uh, Debbie says, is your daughter, who's a practicing physician in Cambridge, as fabulous as you? <laughs> I would say without bias, more fabulous. Um, she's amazing. Yeah, she's uh, yeah finishing residency in June. Oh, and she turns 30 on Saturday. <laughs> Ooh, oh, my gosh. Nice. That just happens so fast. So she's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She lives in Boston, but she was going to be working. In, yeah, she went to Tufts for her residency in family medicine. And her job actually will, I think, is in Cambridge. She just uh, got her first real attending job. So she's going to be, yeah, that's uh, crazy. Anyway, yeah, nice. so she will be there. <laughs> Wonderful. Marguerite says, is there some caution about algae, algae calcium as other calcium supplements for heart disease? Yeah, I think so. I think anytime you're taking large amounts of calcium as a supplement, you need to be mindful and, and wary. Um, I'm always encouraging people to can get their calcium through their food. And if you're uncertain of how much you're taking in to just, you know, put in your food into chronometer, what you're eating on a regular basis for like a week, and you'll get a general idea. There are certain people who may need to be on calcium supplementations. But then if you are required, I would say you want to break it up into smaller chunks throughout the day. Um, it's that rapid absorption that causes the issue. So um, yeah, that's where I'd make a recommendation there. Nice. Okay, let's see. Uh, Diane says, why you look so young? I assume she's talking about you. A few people are saying tofu and tempeh are acquired tastes. If they continue to eat it, they'll they'll end up liking it. That probably is true. And people are saying, oh yeah, here's a great suggestion by Laura. Marinate it in California balsamic vinegar and roast it or air fry it. Mm -hmm. yep. That pretty much, California balsamic, that fixes everything, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Um, somebody is saying that their doctor told them to take salt tablets three times a day because their salt levels are dangerous. That's what Peter is saying. Hmm. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, some people have kidney issues um, that sometimes they end up having to take, uh, you know, some type of sodium salt tablets. Um, otherwise their blood pressure gets too low or, you know, cause they're anyway, they, they've got a kidney issue typically. So that's rare. Um, but if that's the case, you do what your doctor tells you, please. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, somebody's asking a question about a friend and I said, well, you know, cause a lot of these questions are so general. I don't know if you can answer. And a lot of times doctors need more information. I'll read it, but really the friend should come ask. And it says, my friend is having a cyst. What can they do? But I mean, a cyst can be, and they're not even saying where the cyst is, you know? Yeah. So for a cyst. <laughs> um, again, yeah. It depends on where the cyst, you have ovarian cysts, uh, you can have cyst in the skin, you can have a variety. So if I'm assuming if it's in the skin, which typically mo most people dealing with this, um, it really depends again, where it's located, if it's infected or not. Um, yeah. So many times in order to get it permanently dealt with, it has to be cut out when it's not in the state of infection and you want to make sure you get all be cut around the entire thing and pull it out and then you suture it appropriately. Otherwise it'll grow back, but you should really go to someone who knows what they're doing on that. Yeah. Like maybe a dermatologist or dermatologist. Yeah. That would be a, a perfect choice. Sometimes I did tons of cysts when I was practicing in person. So it really just depends on the person. Yeah. And so somebody's asking, are there any plant-based doctors that take insurance? And there probably are, but. Oh, I, mean... I don't know. Yeah. Um, I tried with building another company and it was really hard. Um, not that I, not off the top of my head, but, yeah. but, but if you do see one of them and they pay you, uh, you have to pay, you could use your HSA, FSA in many cases. So ask them for what's called a super bill and then submit it to your insurance. And if you have any out of network um, benefits or, or your HSA, FSA, you might actually get it covered. Yeah. And H so how does one go about having an HSA? Is it like if they have a, a job and the job takes out a certain amount of money? Um, it depends. So uh, your, your job, you could also even if you're self-employed, you could probably even set that up yourself if you wanted to. Um, but the HSA, FSA, yeah, many times the employer is also adding to it as you are also adding to those funds. Um, sometimes you can take those funds and actually invest them in like different parts of this the market. Um, but anyway, the HSA, FSA, these are funds that are available to utilize that 
you know, for prescriptions, like um, let's say that you have a copay and you want to use your HSA, FSA for the copay, or maybe, you know, that will cover the 20% that your insurance doesn't cover, you know, and they cover 80% of the doctor's visit or something. So yeah, th those are what they're typically used for. Mm. And there's a question. Speaking of salt, what kind do you recommend? Celtic, Himalayan, flake, et cetera. So um, again, salt is a, it's got to be mindfully used if you use it at all. Um, so the reason I mentioned that is because salt is, can worsen high blood pressure. Uh, it's not good for you. You want to keep your sodium intake less than 1500 milligrams per day. Um, sodium comes in food, some foods as well. So if you're going to add salt to your food, I personally, especially if you're not getting some of sea vegetables and things, I use iodized salt. Uh, the fancy salts aren't iodized. The reason I use iodized salt is so I can have that source of iodine for my thyroid health. I've absolutely seen plant-based patients come, they go strict SOS free, which is fine. Um, but then they might get uh, actually hypothyroidism. We replace the iodine and it cures itself. It fixes itself right up. We just have to be mindful. Potatoes are a great source of iodine too, but by the way. Um, so again, I, I would be very mindful and not utilize salt if you can avoid it. Or you could use more of a, if you didn't want to do that, you could do a potassium chloride uh, salt, which is a better way to do it. it tastes a little bit differently. Um, another thing you could do is like miso, small amounts of miso. There's high potassium in that. That does help negate the sodium uh, content. Um, so yeah, there's a few different ways to approach it, but I would keep your salt use to a minimum. Thank you. Sassy on Instagram asks, how do you increase your iron levels? So you really want to think about, first of all, if you are not, uh, having heavy menses, you're not, you know, sure, you know, having any losses. Uh, another thing to be mindful is if you're a long distance endurance runner, uh, that's where I discovered some of my iron issues coming as I was training for half marathons and stuff. I was like, there's something about that long distance that beating up your body. Um, and there's a different theories on why that you might lose some iron that way. But what you want to do is increase your iron intake. And these are going to be your dark green leafy veggies. There's legumes, there's nuts and seeds. There's some amazing sources of iron available. And you don't really need a whole lot. If you're, um, I think it's around 18 milligrams daily, if I recall right, for women who are still having menses, and I think it drops down to even eight milligrams per day. But if you're in a deficit, you might want to up that. So just paying attention to the iron-rich foods and really just um, looking at foods that sometimes will inhibit, uh, you know, calcium and iron absorption. So like, for example, if you take um, iron, <clears throat> excuse me, iron-rich foods and you have high sources of calcium, they don't absorb as well. They kind of negate that. I'm going to speak about that in my plant-based workshop, but um, yeah, lots of iron rich foods, dark green leafies, um, beans, legumes are great sources to get started. And on occasion, you may need a supplement. Um, and then again, that's testing and should be advised by a physician because you do not want to overdo an iron supplement because that can be, um, toxic to your organs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Makes sense. Okay. I saw something on Instagram about diverticulitis. My son, Maureen says my son had surgery or at partial colectomy, what diet advice would you give? He's still having some GI problems. Mm. Um, I would encourage a whole food plant-based diet, right? So the important thing is to understand we need to bulk our stool and we need to help our stool move. And so that's, that would be my suggestion is um, again, if he's not used to a plant-based diet, maybe starting kind of pulling back on the beans right away, but starting maybe with lentils, you can cook your food, you can blend your food to make it easier to digest as you're moving towards a healthier plant-based diet. Um, but absolutely, I would encourage um, the more fiber as you progress, the better. Uh, another thing is he might benefit from some type of probiotics. I'm assuming he was on antibiotics, given if he said diverticulitis, meaning infection and inflammation. So he might need some help there with reestablishing some good microbiome. Thanks. Henry says, what can somebody do for inflammation? I hurt my arm and my doctor said the pain was inflammation and gave me all and gave, and that's what gave him all the pain. I didn't want to take the meds. So it depends on what type of hurt inflammation we're 
we're talking about, um, right? Was this a injury, like a sprain or break, a cut? Uh, you know, again, inflammation has its place in healing, right? It rallies the immune system and gets things moving to help the actual healing process start. Um, if it's a chronic inflammatory issue, you might want to pay attention to your diet. Is there something in there? Are you still consuming dairy products? That can be quite inflammatory to joints and different things. Um, again, look at the root cause. If it started from injury, is it not healing appropriately? Do you have a malunion of your bone that's not uh, connecting well? There are lots of things that could be. So you might want to see a specialist if it's ongoing. Perfect. Debbie says, do you ever offer in-person wellness retreats or seminars? That's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't, it's come across my mind. I've been asked that. So maybe in the future, we'll see. <laughs> okay. And Marguerite says, my doctor is urging me to go on osteoporosis medication after I tripped and broke my hip. I really don't want to do it. Is it necessary? And if so, which one do you recommend? Oh, so many questions on that. Um, so I did an entire osteoporosis workbook and workshop, excuse me, and, and ebook. I literally talked to you about everything that you can do. One lifestyle medicine, where you should be in the sense of, you know, what can we do outside of medications? And then I speak to the circumstances of, you know, you've had a fragility fracture, meaning that you've had a fracture. These are different scenarios, right? I'm, there's a different case between someone who has osteopenia, osteoporosis without a fracture versus someone who has had a fracture. With a fracture, this is where medication needs to be considered in light of what caused it, right? So again, I would look at a variety of different things. It's not just a blanket answer for everybody, but I do have that resource at my website if you're interested um, and I'm happy to see you as a patient and discuss it as well. That's great. Um, let's see. Something, well, this is, this is a lot of times people are just putting uh, comments and they're not, if they don't start with question marks. Uh, I, Dr. Marbus, I love your gentle vibe that you possess. Oh, that's a comment. So thank you. Yes. Thank uh, you. you, do. you do, <laughs> is that natural to your personality or do you have to do a lot of stress reduction stuff? To no, be I think at this point in my life, I'm, I'm pretty happy with just being. <laughs> just being you. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, thank you. This was great. I mean, yeah. you don't have to give them 30 pages because nowadays a lot of doctor's offices have that little QR code thing and you just have them scan it on their phone yeah. and it opens up. It's yeah. even magazines. Did you know that? Like I, I used to love going, not that I love going to doctors, but when I was in a <laughs> waiting room, whether it's a doctor or a smog check, I used to love magazines because I don't really subscribe to any other than forks over knives or read them at home. Yeah. I'll be honest, once in a while, I'd see a photo and I'd tear it out for my vision board. And now they got wise to me. And everywhere I go, it's you scan a QR code and you read the magazine on your oh. phone, whether it's people or sport. Isn't that interesting? That's great. And it's great for the environment. So great yeah, the environment. everything's yeah. digital these days, which is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you could, you could do that for your patients. Okay. Absolutely. Well, let's see. Okay. Um, okay, uh, we were going to say goodbye, but I have one more question from Brian. What's the best way from getting for getting off of soda? Oh, first of all, you got to figure out the habits around the soda intake, right? That's number one. You just got to identify where's your triggers, right? Then you're looking at the what is the reward, and then you got to figure out how to dismantle that reward. And there's a few different ways to do that. Um, yeah. There's a few different ways to do that, but I know we're running up on time, but uh, maybe we hold that for next time. Maybe I'll talk about habits next time or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, the only way I, I would, I had a big soda habit till okay. I was 43. I drank a 48 ounce Dr. Pepper big gulp at least once a day from 7 Eleven. And mm. that's because back then, this was over 20 years ago, they didn't have any larger size. And then I would, um, have Coke Slurpee in the morning. So I had to go to an inpatient facility. It was called uh, Optimum Health Institute, but you go to True North and that would mm -hmm. be a good, you know, go True North fast. Mm -hmm. You'll be off in a couple of days. So mm -hmm. anyway. Yep. Uh, but we got to look at the triggers of what caused it to begin with, because it'll be easy to fall back into that trigger habit. Like, is it because you're stressed and you're just drinking and you want that high of the sugar? So abstinence is absolutely best with sugar. But uh, yeah, I would look yeah. at the habit. Yeah, and Pete mm -hmm. Henry saying, so soy is good to eat. Absolutely. We've done yes. so many shows yes. about that. Dr. Barnard has come on many times about his book. Yeah, it's it's it, thumbs up. It processed soy, not not soy candy bars. No. But 
but but actual tofu, tempeh, edamame. Right. The yeah. whole food and not the soy protein isolate. We do not want that. We want the whole soy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Marvis. Thank you, Chef AJ. Bye. And everyone. Th thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in five minutes for a special episode of the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. It's Dr.